members of this panel are the DSP award winners who definitely understand that it is critical to balance standards and innovation to ensure systems, services, and the items we procure are reliable, predictable, safe, available, and affordable. Welcome back to the stage two of the awardees that you met this morning, along with one of the FY19 DSP award winners. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Mr. Victor Rodriguez Santiago for the Mill Standard 889 project. Master Sergeant Bradley Taylor of the EOD Equipment Review Team for incident insensitive munitions disposal. And one of our FY19 DSP award winners, Dr. Robert Jensen, who's worked with Mill Standard 3095 and um, Performance standard the three two six six two. Okay, you've <laughs> yep, certainly. All right, can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for the award this morning. Um, myself and, and the team are very appreciative of of the award and the $5,000 that was not expected. So that's, that's really nice. Thank you very much. Um, so, this presentation is going to be a bit different from what we've seen uh, so far today. Um, this being a technical revision, uh, I wanted to walk us through why it was what what is important about this technical revision, what it took to get there, um, and you know there's going to be a little bit of technical content in it, so bear with me or or enjoy it, whichever way is going to be. All right. So again, uh, this is technical revision. And before we move on, um, I just wanted to to acknowledge a lot of people work on this, right? And and this is many individuals who work on this. Uh, this was a multi-year effort, and um, from from NOCAD, which is the uh, Warfare Center from our uh, that I work on, uh, we also had participants from industry, academia. Um, and uh, of course, the, the, the Navy. Um, we also had uh, Steven Spellafora. He he helped us a lot for the logistics of the you know coordinating with all this, the other services and adjudication of comments and all that. Um, and then of course all the services, all the members of the services that in one way or another uh, participated and helped with this. So. <clears throat> So corrosion is a multi-billion dollar problem for, for the Navy, right? And, uh, you know, through through teardown reports, we've estimated that about 80% of all the damage is uh, at Galvanic, uh, near or at Galvanic interfaces. And here, you know, you have some pictures of how it looks like. Uh, it's not pretty in some uh, instances. Um, and the, the worst part of it is that galvanic corrosion accelerates other other methods or other forms of damage, such as pitting corrosion, stress corrosion cracking, fatigue cracking, cracking, intergranular cracking. So there's a lot of damage that already occurs, but galvanic corrosion accelerates it. And ultimately, this all affects our mission-capable assets turnaround times, maintenance man hours. So this is this is a design issue, this is a maintenance issue, this is a depot issue, uh, this is a mission capability issue, right? So corrosion is 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 a big problem. It, it has been acknowledged uh, our, our three star uh, last year, uh, two years ago, they instituted within Navair the corrosion management board. Uh, and this that was an acknowledgement of, of of the, the, the scope of the problem. Um, 
So as far as the standard, um, the mill standard 89 hadn't been revised since 1967. Okay, it was the, the technical content on it uh, was based on a on an army uh, AMCOM report. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, in going through school, you probably came across the uh, galvanic table of potentials that determines galvanic compatibility. It comes from here, you know, from the 1967 revision. And it, you know, it, it had, it served its purpose, it, but it, it was obvious that it was not keeping up to the new advancements of, of, of the problem of corrosion, right? So, um, I, I uh, and I also want to thank you the uh, to thank the uh, the Office of Naval Research. They were the ones who funded this effort. Without their funding, this would not have happened at all. Um, so I, I wanted to acknowledge that. So in 2016, we decided. You know, we we took uh, a look at the uh, current at the beta revision. And we just went over and modernized it. You know, it was basically, you know, we took some references that are obsolete. We took them out. We replaced them with, with current references. But there was nothing technical. So it took, if you see, from 2016 to 2021, when it was finally published, that's how long it took to go through the technical revision. That was, that was the scope um, of, of that uh, of revision. So I wanted to take you here through some of the concepts, right? So the galvanic table of potentials is the main idea within the standard. Um, and I just wanted to guide you a little bit through it. Um, so basically, when you have a metal, it's usually an oxidized metal. It's ore, right? You take it and you process it, you put energy into it, and you end up with a metal, right? But that is really not the stable configuration of that metal, right? And I, this is kind of like a little drawing of here's the ore, it's happy, it's in this va valley here, it, it's very stable. When you process it, you take it into a metallic form, but it really doesn't want to be there. So that, that's the concept of corrosion, right? That's why all these metals corrode, right? They don't want to be there. That is not their stable configuration. And sort of like pictorially, the difference between these two valleys is that potential, right? Is that energy that you had to put in it to make it into one form or the other. And this little hump here is how fast would happen, right? How fast this metal would go back to where it wants to be, which is the oxide. And those are the two concepts that are, are basically underpinning this revision. The potential, the galvanic table of potentials, that's where it comes from that difference, and it tells you, is it possible? Is it possible to take one of these two forms, right? And then where we're taking it is, basically, we don't really, it is important to know is if it's going to happen, if it's going to corrode, but we know it's going to, most of the metals that we use, is it how fast it's, cor it's corroding? That is a, a key concept, and that's what, you know, Again, this is the normal table of potentials that you would see in books or you know anywhere. Um, and the diff and you have a bunch of different metals or families of metals. And the difference between the two, that is the potential, right? And and, and the standard as it was really didn't give a requirement uh, as to how, you know, how how little of a difference to make these two metals compatible, right? It was just minimize it, try to make it smaller. That, that was not good enough. That was not good enough of a requirement for acquisition. And as, as we all know, acquisition is based on requirements and they have to be clear requirements. So that was, that was the aim here to change it from potential to, to the kinetics, how fast. And that's, um, that's uh, where we're gonna move. And one thing, I'm, I don't know if the, for the presentation, I had some um, things that were moving, so I don't know if it's gonna mess up the things, we'll see. So again, going back to, to the table of potentials, right? So the idea really was to minimize the potential difference between, between two dissimilar metals. And if you were to use that galvanic here on the, on the right, if you were to use the galvanic table of potentials, 
it would tell you that you can match stainless steels uh, that are they're better, uh, to, you know, a better choice to mate it with aluminum, right? Because their difference is smaller, right? So you would tell you, don't, don't pair anything with titanium, right? Don't pair aluminum with titanium. That's a bad choice. But if you actually take the data, the, the, the rate data, the corrosion data, it tells you that titanium gives you an order of magnitude or more or, or, or less current between these, these two metals. So obviously, the old galvanic table based on potential was not giving us, at, in many occasions, the right uh, the right decision making. So, and it is, it is because galvanic potential doesn't tell you the whole story. And if you remember that little diagram, is that little hump is is uh, how quickly things happen. So, the technical revision uh, obviously required a new approach. Uh, basically, what we wanted to do is replace the galvanic table uh, with a similar table based on current or rate as opposed to potential, uh, use specific alloys rather than generic uh, materials uh, families, um, include a simple way of adjusting for areas, right? It's, it's, a, it's different if you have a big component or a small component, the area bears, matters. So we included that in there. Um, generate, potential, uh, generate data using potential dynamic techniques and process the data using uh, available theories. So basically, we took a four-step approach. Uh, we developed first, this data didn't exist, so we had to be generated. So we had to develop a methodology to generate the data, right? That was step one. Second, we needed to validate that the, uh, validate and verify that the method was actually good. And uh, of course, generate the data and process the data. Right? And again, just want to remind you that this is what we're doing. We're, we're addressing how fast is the rate, how, how fast this corrosion will happen. So uh, step one, we develop a methodology document uh, that would outline the requirements on, uh, on how to generate the data. So we publish that, and uh, um, this is kind of like a table that summarizes a lot of the requirements on, on how to take the data, and it goes on from everything, every detail, how to clean the substrates and, you know, what data, you know, what techniques, everything, right? We wanted to standardize how to generate the data. So basically, it, we had to create a little standard within the standard on how to generate the data. So step two, we needed to validate and verify the data. And it was critical that we had to ensure that the methodology that we generate, that we created would be reproducible within labs and across labs. And, and we use uh, uh, ASTM E691 as is a round robin um, spec. So we wanted to, to do this properly. And again, as I mentioned, this was a big effort and we included uh, academia, industry, and of course uh, uh, ourselves in the Navy to generate this data. And we, and they, these were the par partners uh, for this round robin, right? So we gave that standard how to generate data, and we saw, we said, here it is, generate data. You know, everybody came back. We have all this data. We processed it. We analyzed it, and at the end of the day, we, you know, we concluded that uh, through the round robin that the methodology would gen indeed generated reproducible data. So that was a critical step in there. Okay, so this is where I think we're gonna have run into trouble with the animations. <laughs> it's okay. So I've been talking, it's, it's all messed up, but uh, I'll walk you through it. So basically, I've been talking about the data and this is how the data looks, right? It's basically you're measuring, you measure potential and it gives you, you apply a potential and you, give, and you measure a current. So for example, for a stainless steel like 13.8, this is how it will look like, right? And each of these regions tell you something very unique about the metal, right? It tells you about the dissolution of the metal, if the metal pits, pitting is a, is a type of, of damage that occurs in metals. It tells you how easily 
when it when it acts as a cathode, uh, how easily it can take electrons away from that metal, for example, from aluminum, right? Um, and and it's it's behind this, but you you can extract a lot of that information. And uh, uh, after that, we develop a methodology also to analyze the data. So this is actually not the raw data. This is actually the fitted data that we uh, we fitted. So basically take a bunch of data, average it, and then generate have this, this piece of data that you can uh, modify whichever way you want and extract the values. Um, so basically how it all comes together when you collect all that data, so basically, you collect this data on individual metals, right? And you put them together, right? Where they meet, that's where you obtain your galvanic potential and your galvanic current. Uh, we also use other methods to verify that this approach was the correct and an appropriate approach. Um, so basically, from here, you obtain the galvanic current, which you can then change into a, a, a corrosion rate. A corrosion rate tells you how much of that material is corroding away as a function of time, right? So that's how much you can expect, let's say, aluminum to corrode away when you pair it with a stainless steel. And by the way, now that I mentioned stainless steels, it's a misconception that stainless steels don't corrode. They do corrode, and they corrode a lot, and they suffer from a lot of corrosion damage as well. So this is an eye chart. But this is this is the culmination of this, right? This is what's in the spec now on the standard. Uh, it has a bunch of metals here on the left, uh, the same metals on the top, and it is a matrix. And if you want to know, I have this metal that I, I'm proposing to match with this one. I have a, a sub a little minimum substrate, and I have this stainless steel fastener that I want to put together. And you go there and you find it, and it will tell you. Um, so the difference between this table and what was before is that um, it would tell you if it was compatible or not. Here we're saying it is, but also there are levels of compatibility, right, of incompatibility. So if it's rated a zero, mostly down here, those two couples, whatever th those two couples are compatible, meaning that you don't have to do anything extra to protect them. Anything above a, a zero is incompatible. So for acquisition, it means you cannot put them together without protection. That's what it means for acquisition, right? But the added benefit for the subject matter experts who are working on this is that this levels of in incompatibility give the SMEs the, the ability to uh, provide risk assessments to the programs, right? So if they are one, yes, they're incompatible, but that is not as bad as a six, right? So if you are in a six, you may want to throw the kitchen sink at, at, at that couple to protect it. If you're a one, maybe you can get away with less protection. So that, that was the added benefit that, uh, that we did for the standard so that, and it is mostly for the SMEs, for, for the technical authority, just to be able to, uh, to provide more guidance to the program. So I think the spec is now a, a most useful a more useful standard uh, to use. So here are some, you know, some comparison between the the previous revision and now the new technical revision. Uh, there was no clear requirement. We've added that. Um, you know, you you can make clear decisions because there was really no requirement to say what's compatible or not. Um, it accounts for the kinetics or the rate, which is what tells you whether these things are compatible or not. Uh, it will tell you how quickly that the anode, which is the, the one that corrodes, how quickly it will corrode. So you can make assessments about that. Um, and it, ga it gave you, you know, a methodology to generate data. So that table that I showed you before is very limited, right? I mean, this took a lot of time to generate, right? So it's, it's, it's sad to see it so sh small and short, right? But um, the, the good thing is that within the standard, we added the methodology. So if you have a couple that is not here, you can take the measurements, 
right? And we know that if you follow those that methodology, you're going to generate good data, right? So, um, so again, the reason we're doing this is be for acquisition, right? Because we, we work in, in an acquisition environment, we need to provide accurate requirements, right? So, um, so some of the improvements or impacts of the acquisition is, you know, we transition uh, from galvanic potential to uh, uh, galvanic uh, current. This improved the decision making in early design and sustainment, right? So this is not just a standard that just for new design. You know, if you're going through a, an engineering change proposal, you can use the concepts here to guide the, the changes. It improves the material compatibility. It increases the understanding of what the relationships between these. Um, second, we added categories of, uh, of incompatibility as, as opposed to just pass or fail. And then again, as I explained, the SMEs that gives them more material, more, more information to provide to the PMAs or to the, to the program offices to provide uh, you know, assessments. And we added the best practices, right? So, you know, it, it decreases the, the overall, uh, you know, effect is to decrease related maintenance. Um, I think this is my last slide, but I also wanted to mention, um, and it just came up in conversation. I, I don't, I don't remember who, but a a private company has oh, take hold on to this, and they have created. A uh, a computer uh, software that uses the mill standard 889, and they're selling it to the primes, right? To the contractors, to the Boeing's, to the Lockheed's. Basically, it's it's a it does what that table does, but in you know in a computer software. And they tell you know I want to put this metal with this metal, and it spits out incompatible or not, and what treatments for treatments you could use. So. We've partnered with this, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an SBIR company, a small company. Um, and they're, I mean, they're making good business with this, uh, but it is because industry realizes that the impact that change into this new methodology is having. So uh, we're very happy, I'm very happy. This, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that we've done here. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward. The standard, we already have the first acquisition program, new acquisition program that is using the SPAC as a requirement, uh, the EXX, which is the replacement of the ET6 uh, program. So um, again, it's, it's already been implemented. So we're, I'm, I'm very happy, very proud. And thank you. Any questions? I have, sorry, I, I have a question. Yes. So, so you mentioned under 889 Delta, that there's one environment being proposed and there's future environments. Are you considering like extreme temperature or humidity based environments for the future? Over. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's a good question. So this data was collected, um, what we call immersion conditions, right? Uh, and we use artificial seawater as the electrolyte, right? Um, maybe for, for the ship environment or sub environment that could work. Uh, but it's not very realistic for all, most of applications, which is what we call atmospheric corrosion, is the, or thin film corrosion. You, you get sprayed with sea salt, with sea spray, and it's, it dries out. And then, depending on the humidity, it can re-wet or re-dry, right? So we have a whole nother effort in that area, and we're starting to generate data similar to this on the, this thin film environment. So basically. We recognize that the drying and drying and wetting cycles that all our assets experience uh, is very critical, and actually, it, it it enhances the cracking and the damage that we that they see. So that's the next step that we're trying to take. Yes. Oh, this is Rich Forcellius from Lockheed Martin. So don't mind me as being the voice of industry here. Um, why not delegate 889 to ASTM and turn it over to them and integrate the voice of industry as part of the development and revision? And also, there's a significant environmental component in all of this. Uh, you know, we contractors uh, have to comply with uh, uh, global environmental 
regulations, including a, a reduction of CAD and CAD plating, et cetera. Um, and in some instances, there may be um, an argument on uh, the compatibility and uh, the corrosion resistance where we, in order to sell, sell FMS, if you will, um, you know, need to go with the more environmentally friendly alternative. Uh, is that integrated here at all in the standard? Thank you for the question. That's a great question. I didn't show it here, but we added a couple of tables to the standard uh, addressing not only, these are bare metals, right? This is just bare metals. Uh, we included data with conversion coatings, including hexavalent chrome, but also trichrome. We didn't test any of the uh, non-chrome uh, alternatives uh, because from our perspective, they don't protect us as, as well. Um, we also added anodize as one of the surface treatments for, for it. Um, so again, the great thing about what we did here is that we created this methodology. So if the data needs to be generated, it can be generated, right? It, it, it doesn't have to go, we don't have to generate the data. We, we created a process now that um, as any industry can generate the data, they just, they just need to show us the data and there's, there's the validation data step there. As, as long as you show us the validation state, we will validate your data that you generate. So with regard to the spec and why not make it a, a non-government spec, um, we have worked with AMP, used to be NACE. Um, the methodology to generate the data is now a commercial and non-government and non-government spec. So not the 889 itself, not for the com compatibility itself, but how to generate the data, we partner with AMP, and that is now a, a non-government spec. One more question. Uh, yes, does this have any implicate? Okay. Okay, in the back. Jim? Does, does this have any implication for battery design? Oh, yeah, sorry. Did you hear? Did you get any of that? Okay. <laughs> Is that good? All right. I think I'm out of time. All right. right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And to remind you, when I sat down, there, there's also a standard for configuration management. And if I followed some of the best practices in there, I might not have a different version of the agenda that caused us to go right through our break. So if you need to take a break, <laughs> please get up. And, and I'm sure our speakers will be uh, you know, patient and accommodating as you flow in and out. The next uh, master sergeant. All right, is this one on? It is on, okay. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to be accepting this award on behalf of my team. Um, the Air Force is currently working in a service hallway with the other service branches. Uh, we are just one entity of a board that reports to another board, so um, in typical fashion, right? Uh, congratulations to the other award recipients as well. I did not do a PowerPoint, which is, I know, awkward for the Air Force, but Bear with me. Um, I would be remiss if I did not thank the Department of Air Force, obviously, for you know allowing us to put forth this award. Obviously, my chain of command, which is the Air Force Material uh, Command, my Air Force Civil Engineer Center, and my Readiness Directorate. 
So we are a, a geographically separated unit uh, that is currently staged in conjunction with Naval Surface Warfare Center Indian Head, and I am the Air Force component of that, um, that relationship down there. So a little background and why I'm here. I understand and I'm not ignorant to the fact that my community is very small and is very niche, and our mission sets are, have historically in the last two decades uh, been more about bomb suits and IEDs than munition items. However, as we're transitioning into the next bite, um, we have been taking that very seriously, and this is some of the problem areas that we started to dissect as we came across um, new technologies that have been, I guess, in creation for the last two decades. We're just playing a little catch up, okay? So in 1634, a gunpowder factory in Malta accidentally detonated, which caused a huge explosion. This incident killed 22 people and damaged numerous buildings and properties. In 1943, a truck filled with 24 aerial depth charges detonated, killing 50 people and injuring 386 more. In 1984, munitions fire at Soviet naval base caused reactions that killed 200 to 300 people. These are just a few incidences that have happened over the last hundreds of years um, that have made us really start looking at munitions and their configurations, not only in storage, but also transportation, as well as their, their design moving forward. So recognizing this danger um, with improper storaging and handling, NATO actually set out to solve this problem and make the process of delivering combat power safer and more reliable. And in doing so, NATO developed a policy that munitions would contain a component called insensitive high explosives. With every great solution though, comes problem areas and limitations. And this just happened to affect my community um, with this design. Not only is our equipment and our procedures not working anymore on these items, but the musicians are actually resistant to traditional um, means in which we dispose of this hazard. So imagine yourself, nobody really cares what we do until I shut down six city blocks. Uh, now you take that and you, you know, exponentially put that out as we are looking forward to the amount of munition items that have this filler, as well as what this will do to range safety and uh, the environment, because we can't get rid of it. So in traditional munitions, EOD personnel, myself, can place a donor charge on that munition item and initiate it via sympathetic detonation or just think of chain reactions. However, when using these traditional procedures on today's munitions that have insensitive high explosives in it, we found that they just broke open and just scattered stuff all across, whether it be a range, an incident site, or somebody's backyard. The undissolved exposed explosives bring forth toxic hazards to not only personnel nearby, civilians, but it also puts things into the air and into the soil and the environment. Realizing the severity of this problem, my team, along with academia, industry, and several government agencies, decided to go to work a few years ago. My team is composed of military members in the Air Force specifically, but I also serve a larger board that's joint service in nature. We serve as a primary focal point to the Military Technical Acceptance Board, which is a board of O4s, which then will go forward to a program board of O5s and 6s. This past year, we concluded a comprehensive study of the problem, conducted extensive research and development. These efforts resulted in a repurposing of the United States Marine Corps explosive um, vehicle born IED access charge. So think about a charge that was created for the last two decades in accessing a vehicle born IED that was used as a ladder. Throughout this research study and understanding the different techniques and procedures that were needed, we took that ladder and made it a bridge and it happened to work. So we were able to repurpose something that was already designed and created, saving millions of dollars in order for us to get after our problem, which is creating um, a charge big enough for us to actually detonate um, insensitive munitions. So this tool design and methods of employment were, not, were then delivered to the joint EOD community and we, were, we shared it with our international partners. 
allowing for implementation across the globe. The forecasted manpower needs of the next war indicates that our forces aren't really going to change. Therefore, the, this program needs standardization processes to dispose of America's insensitive munitions, as well as munitions from other entities across the globe. The insensitive munition problem is currently at a 95% solution as it sits right now. The material solution has been developed and the technical manuals should be complete within the next three to six months. Uh, this development means that every American service member and international partner across the 98 na nations who attend e our Naval uh, School EOD will be given these procedures and taught these procedures. The Equipment Review Board team navigated these challenges and delivered a big win for the joint program, the Department of the Defense, and our NATO partners. And I will pause there for, I'm sure, a slew of questions as to what I do. Yes, this may sound stupid, but here we are. Um, so the Russian T-72 problem isn't so much this where they store their munitions, but that it's not sensitive. It's it is not insensitive. Is that correct? So I don't I don't want to get into specifics when it comes to ordnance items. Okay. So um, hence why I actually really decided not to do a PowerPoint because getting it cleared was becoming more problematic than anything. Um, so when you're talking individual items themselves, the problem with insensitive high explosives is that there is what's called a critical diameter for you to get sympathetic detonation. So if you're looking at C4, which is our, our common means of disposing of munitions, C4, you're looking at a quarter to a half inch. That is what the critical diameter, that is what the shock wave is gonna produce that's going to start and initiate the, the that's the donor charge to your, whatever your item is, right? In this particular case, it would be a munition item. Well, what we've realized is that stuff that has insensitive high explosives, depending on the filler, the diameter of the munition, the size of the munition, it starts to change the critical diameter. And it's not just like, let's double it. It's like times it by five. So now during the process, not just with the material solution of one piece of equipment, we also had to look at the actual techniques that we are, that we are using to detonate things. So it came, it came back with wave shaping, which now we're starting to talk about how things react within open air environments, how they can be collided. So if you put them together specifically, and I have a gap, as the explosive occurs, it creates a shock wave. The shock waves eventually touch, and at that touching point, that's actually where you're getting your highest amount of diameter. So we had to think about that in terms of, now we have the skin of the munition item itself, now you're also talking about where inside of that munition do you actually have to start that initiation. So every item, unfortunately, has to be looked at. <laughs> now, if the diameter is under a certain amount, we have found that it doesn't necessarily matter. It's when you start to get over a certain millimeter in diameter that it starts to become problematic. And that's where all the, the techniques and the training are coming in. That's where the literature is being driven to our basic school of uh, you know, down at, at Eglin so that we can start training that and teaching that right away and putting that into the individual service branches uh, training curriculum. I, I hope that answered. I, sorry, I can't speak to, I just don't know the classification I don't, and I'm not that savvy off the top of my head to be like, oh yeah, that's on class. Let me just start throwing that out there. Sorry to have asked that question. <laughs> Working across joint and and being able to apply a standard for our allies as well. What what are some things that you see as key to your success and be able to get that that buy in and, and work across you know, services joint coalition? Yeah. Uh, so this is actually that's a great question. So this is my first what would you would consider a staff gig, right? I, not an officer, so just started getting to the spots where my lens is changing a little bit. Um, I think that to answer that question, seeing what it has to do across, so that when you're talking stand nags and you're talking 
DDDs, DODDs, and you're talking DODIs, and you're, you're looking to change that literature. I think that that was the most educational piece of this entire process, right? So my lens is of an individual that's on the ground, whether it be you know over the past few decades of war, because um, I have done the Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria situation, but now being able to articulate that upwards as to a problem set that I see on the ground and what that does to a ground force commander, what that does to our freedom of maneuver and what that does, not just doc, you know, doctrine wise, but what that does to what they want us to do on the ground. So when, when trying to explain this, pro, this problem, a lot of people gave us blank stares because at the time you throw out those numbers and you're saying, well, you're no longer having sympathetic detonations within AHAs, Blahas, or wherever these storage facilities are. Um, but when you start talking about the ramifications down the road when it's environmental, um, or the fact that I'm just pulverizing things into the ground and not actually getting rid of it, and it just stays there for generations, I think that that was the, the point where we started really understanding um, how we could influence and change that, that culture and that, that instruction. So it was very educational, and we had a big team that helped us with all that, obviously. Uh, I didn't just rewrite a DODI, so that, but um, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Any online? Okay. Well, thank, thank you again. Appreciate it. Dr. Jensen. Okay, so I'm, on. so I'm Rob Jensen from the uh, Army Research Lab. And uh, just on the previous speakers, so Victor, to put your numbers in perspective, I think corrosion is, corrosion losses are two to 3% annually of the, of the GDP, the, globe, the global GDP. So that's how, that's how big the problem is. And then uh, for Master Sergeant Taylor, if you get into a doomsday situation where ammunition explodes in your backyard and it flagrates and you have raw propellant sitting on your yard, don't pick it up with your with your bare hands. It's plasticized with nitroglycerin. So what's going to happen is you'll it, it'll seep through your skin. It'll dilate your blood vessels. So it'll get it'll lower your blood pressure and it'll just pass out. So don't pick it up with your hands. All right. Yeah. Anyways, so I, I have a I have a unique perspective on on uh, maybe my background because I, I was enlisted Navy before uh, before I came back to before I came back to college and graduate school to uh, get my PhD in, in physical chemistry. So I've I've kind of hit both ends of the spectrum from a you know an end user perspective to uh, to being a being a nerd to the to the academic literature. So I can hit both ends and then uh. Like where does one learn how to how to write standards? So for me, it was I was familiar with the with the language from from doing a from doing flight uh, flight calls on a maintenance level for just I just knew how to read the language. So I I always carried that with me through my through my uh, academic career. And then we got in a situation where we needed the standards from uh from bonded armor situations from uh from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan was really where the, the, the power of the standard met with uh, with operational requirements for Army. So this is about uh, this is about how to operationalize science through, I call them anticipatory or translational DOD performance requirements. And then uh, the, the, the first version of this came out was MIL standard uh, 3059, it came out in 2019. That's when we won the award, and I didn't have an opportunity to collect five thousand dollars because it was that was the the conference was canceled for a for a coronavirus. But I'm I'm confident that somebody owes me five thousand dollars now. All right. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to talk a lot about and then and then you know thirty thirty two six sixty two is the, is the follow on is the PRF version so we could carry a qualified products list for for what we did in thirty fifty nine so it's, it's 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 almost the same thing. So I'm going to talk about Army capability caps and commercial opportunity leap ahead performance we got out of it translational science anticipatory timing and then finally this whole st this standard was 
born out of a database and it's it the whole the whole standard is is data science enabled so uh so this is this is the two problems that that we have on the on the army side is it is a huge army capability gap and then and a, and a counterpart a significant problem with the adhesives industry so the capability gap with the army is 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 high strength and high damage tolerance for uh, for for bonded armor assemblies and I'll, I'll talk some more about this in a, in the next slides but basically we're all right, if, if if anybody you know flew to DC for this conference, you know it's just I was just down in Houston last week, so I was on a, on a plane. So you're enjoying a nice bonded. There's so much bonded air, aircraft structures where where you know the composites are all are all bonded. There's a lot of aluminum, aluminum to titanium to titanium bonding in those in those airplanes, and it's a very very stable environment. That technology that's known to fly an aircraft has been around for about 50 years it's it's all old stuff there's really and it's a it's a pretty stable environment whereas you contrast that with what we see with with ground vehicle is a threat evolution is is very very fast and then as we learned in iraq and afghanistan the adversaries are they're smart humans too i mean they figure out you know once you get around an armor package on the side of the vehicle it doesn't take them too long to throw you a different threat underneath the vehicle and so on and so forth so our pace evolution is is very very fast on on the ground vehicle side. It the evolution is much much faster than you'll see in the flight environment. And then our our requirements are, you know, what works good for aviation doesn't necessarily work work good for a, for a ground vehicle. And then our our pain points are it's a uh, it's it is from an academic perspective it's an extremely extremely difficult problem to understand. Um, there's no scaling relationships in armor packages. If you stop you know, you've got an armor package that's this, th that's this thick, stops a bullet, you know, a pointy bullet going at this velocity. Well, now they're shooting a, a, a bigger pointy bullet at a higher velocity. Well, you just scaled the armor package, right? It's like, no, it's not. It's not there's no scaling relationships in, in armor. And then uh, traditional solutions are, are, you know, we, you know, try to try to get our needs out by our, under our, our gaps out through peer, peer review academic literature or, Publications and conference proceedings. Uh, the problem with those is they're low impact and low commercial relevance. And then uh, on the adhesives industry side, their major pain point is is new product is is dislodging an incumbent product from a, from an existing marketplace. All right. So think about this like for say if I want to go through an aviation spec with like 15 qualification tests on it to 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 meet you know qualification criteria those 15 tests probably translate into probably about 1.5 to 2 million dollars of of labor to go through to to go through the quals on that it's it's expensive to to get through a to get through a qualification so it's uh you know it just leads to a lot of a lot of incumbent lock-in it's like why does why should i try a new adhesive you know or a new product you know if yeah, i've been using the same thing for 10 years it's it's a, the the pain threshold is too high to get through new new products. So I, you know, why bother? And then the traditional solution for on the in the industry side is just like they're just going to pepper you with with free product samples and PDF technical data sheets, um, and they've got a low success rate on it. Like for me in a lab, it's like when somebody somebody sends you a one quart sample of quote unquote free sample to try out it's not really free it's just like even for me in, in the lab it's like it's a minimum of me like thirty five thousand fifty thousand dollars to get through the testing just to verify what's on what's on the what's on the pdf sheet so it, it's problematic on on their side too however these 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 two two problems were they're intractable if you if you view them independently but they're completely solvable when you solve these two problem sets at, at the same time. All right, so this is a, I'm just gonna walk through briefly on the technical with, with this. It, it kind of, you know, I think it ties in nicer with, with nicely with some of the earlier stories where we talk about how do you, how do you want something from TRL level, TRL level zero through a, through a, through a technical standard. And basically this is how it happens. So, so here's our, here's our, Technology gap. So, is a 
you know, we're looking you know, at bonded armors for for a ground vehicle. And then this is like real quick. This is this is how nothing classified here. This is all out in the public domain. This this is how a bonded armor assembly works. You've got the projectile coming in, and there's a there's a ceramic strike face. There's an adhesive, and there's some kind of backing plate, and that's either a composite or a metal. All right, this is how uh, ar bonded armors work. It's a the adhesive's not there to stop the bullet. The backing plate is not there to stop the bullet. The ceramic is what stops the bullet. So ceramics are very, very strong in compression and and then very, very weak in tension. So what the what the backing plate does is is it is it is it holds the holds the ceramic in a compressive state for as long as possible to to get the dwell time on it. So what the what the ceramic does is is, is it shatters around into smaller pieces to, to decrease the likelihood of, of penetration. And then uh so in non-technical terms, what did I just say? So uh so if anybody's ever ever tiled a floor, anything like bathroom floor tiles or, or kitchen floor tiles, it's like once you have that ceramic tile on the floor, you could drive a pickup truck over that, right? Nothing's gonna happen to that floor, but like what happens when you take the tile out of the box? How many did you drop out of the box and it is shatter, right? Right when you drop out of the box. Well, it's the same thing is happening with the with the ceramic armor packages. So what the adhesive there is for is is to localize localize that damage behind individual ceramic tiles. So when one ceramic tile gets taken out, it doesn't debond behind neighbors. So I'm not worried about this necessarily the first shot. I'm worried about the second, third, and fourth bullet that are gonna that are gonna hit the hit the damp hit the hit the armor package. And then this is how they're tested. So this is this is one of our range tests on the uh and at a at a gun range and just for perspective so this this is the armor package it's it's the white color here with the speckled dots on the back it's probably about twice the size of the floor monitor it probably weighs about maybe you know 250 to 300 pounds if you put up there with a with a forklift it's it's sitting at an obliquity so it, it, if you were looking at it this way it's it's leaned away from it's leaned away from your perspective the 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 gun is on the other side here, so so the gun shoots towards this towards the screen. The speckle patterns are to to to, to get the three D deformation on high speed high speed photography when it's so we can get the mechanics on the back plate. What you don't see you don't see the the flash X rays on the side, the high speed cameras in the back, which are aimed off of mirrors on the top, so they don't get you know you don't wipe out a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of test equipment with the with the frags flying off the back. But the bottom line is it's like each one of these tests, I think they're about ballpark probably about fifty thousand dollars a shot when you're when you're fully is instrumented. So they're they're expensive. You know, they're expensive, they're complex, and they're commercially irrelevant. They mean absolutely nothing to industry partners, right? So on the industry side, this this is what matters for them. This this is a, a a simple single lap joint configuration. This is just two bonded pieces of aluminum. You stick a little of adhesive on it, and then you measure it on a on a load frame, and, and then uh, measure the brake strength. And then these are cheap, simple, and then and then a commercial benchmark. So so what we did is like, well, how do you correlate from from this to this? And then uh. This this is a typical range as you'll you'll see on on lap shear strength. Um, again, I, um, my apologies, I nerded out. This is um it's in megapascals. So this is the uh, for for journal publication, but uh but 35 megapascals that's about 5,000 pounds per square inch. So uh, aviation is up always up here in the upper end of this is about 5,000 pounds per square inch, and it's and it's only these adhesives that are that are used for flight. Whereas armor, we'll see across the whole spectrum depending on what what the armor package is all right this is a this is this is the this is my my busy slide so so what we did is it's like we learned out of this you know in iraq and afghanistan the, the problem with you know we were, we were facing threats so fast in in those two wars was like you just can't you you can't reinvent the wheel Every every time you know a new threat comes in, it's just like you you, you it's just impossible from from an R and D perspective to to pace what's coming in. 
So at that time, it was like 2008 time frame. We, we shifted the, the team, the adhesives team over to run it on a, on a database, on a, on a materials informatics platform to capture data faster. So we had all this all this data on 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 adhesives and then and then, uh you know hundred you know thousands of adhesive data points on on a on a few hundred adhesives and then basically what we were able to do was was correlate to do rigorous uh statistical multivariate statistical analysis to get the correlation maps and correlation statistics to our friend the single single lap share joint which is the industry benchmark and then what we did is, is we found out when we took maximum strength and incorporated displacement and complete failure, lo and behold, we got a we got a correlation to armor performance. So again, uh aerospace is gonna is gonna trend this way. But uh this is just a flash X ray of, of one of the of one of our ballistic targets. There's a lot of delamination around the around the neighbor. But when we were out in this region, the the damage tolerance was was very, very high. All right, so that's uh that's an army army capability gap, you know. An army capability gap is is a is a commercial opportunity because look, you know, these are all commercial adhesives and there's we didn't see any adhesives in the commercial space that were that were that were that were fitting our needs. All right, so here's a big jump to the standard. If I bracket it and write it like a standard. So here's the here's that same, you know, based on correlation statistics, here's here's our gap and it's this is how we how we defined it in a in a in a in a performance spec, and then we just throw in a little you know some room temperature testing, some hot wet, and some elevated temperature testing to to uh, you know as additional screens. So what's important on this is 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 before 2018, we didn't have any. There were no existing commercial products that would that would meet our our Group One requirements. And then, uh, so we we handed that adhesive, you know, that the adhesive companies would come would come through the door at ARL, and, and then we handed it to uh, PPG. And then uh, they were interested in the standard. And then uh, a year and a half later, they they came back with with PPG PR twenty nine thirty, which is a tough and epoxy. It was the first thing that we'd seen commercially that that passed our requirements. Not just not just passed our requirements. It, it it blew away the state of the art for for adhesives. Um, this is how good that adhesive was. So the outcomes on that, you know, PPG went from PR level one to MRL nine in four years with that adhesive on commercial product. We we have it in the lab now as commercial product to to test in armor in armor packages. Um, they independently val validated all all the statistics that we used to to derive 32662. This is significant too. It also won first place in the uh, this product also won first place in the in the industry awards for for adhesives and sealants uh, industry award um, in 2020 for innovative product of the year, and it was pulled by the standard. Um, and it's available as as DoD. Uh, as for for DoD trials as obtainable commercial product. All right, so this is this I'm gonna I'm gonna this was a big concept on 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 uh on big perspective shift on on standards and why this one was successful is I just 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 Rob's humble opinion right is. DOD is just too small of an entity now to to drive commercial commercial innovation or commercial product development. Now uh, it's like we're not like I think in the 1960s we were one third of all our global R and D. Now we're about like three percent, and then uh, you know we just don't we just don't have the money to uh, to to drive product like like we we used to back you know 30, 40, 50 years ago. So why this performance spec was successful is because we attached incentive to it where where it was attractive in the commercial domain specifically armor adhesives work well in in a pillar and b pillar compartments for for automotive for for side impact so when you get you know if your car gets hit on on a side impact crash those are all bonded steel hatch structures and then the use the adhesive. Everybody thinks it's for light weighting. It's not for light weighting. So the adhesive the adhesive because it's is stress it pushes the load over a wider area. 
it actually gives you more crash impacted energy absorbance absorption than if it was spot welded or pop pop rivets. It just gives you superior performance. And then uh that's currently that's adhesive fastening for automotive is is 15% of a of a of a 1.5 billion a year vehicle assembly market and it's growing at four times the GDP. So that's the driver for it. It's like we want PPG to sell over there to automotive because it's going to sustain it for for the army to, to be able to buy it. And then uh and then why, you know, companies like PPG value, why they're, why they're so hard on going after the mill standard qualification. It's like, this is the difference between, it's again, Rob, Rob's opinion, a top, you know, a top tier company. They realize the value is, yes, it's just like, yes, he'd like to sell the army. The army might buy some if they get some on an acquisition program. More important than what you get on the on the performance standard is is branding. It's just that product's been vetted through DOD. It makes it makes that product worth more money in the commercial domain. That's where the that's where the the DOD value added is added is. And then when it lets it lets the company vet it out through the DOD, they get the uh, they get the brand endorsement on it. It makes it easier for them to sell to OEM automotive where they where they want it to sell because it's got that. It's got that DOD brand endorsement. If anybody uh, remembers when uh, when Ford switched to the from the steel body under F one fifteen F one fifty to the aluminum body in two thousand fifteen, remember the marketing campaign for that. So I think they're just using that. It's a it's a six thousand series aluminum that's that's used in the uh, that's used in the F one fifty. That's our flagship vehicle. The marketing campaign for that was it was always it's military grade aluminum. So it's just like or the branding, the, the branding potential on, on a standard is very, very high. Um, just in just in perspective, where where we are with with that adhesive that that was led by the standard, it's uh it's again these are these are these are these are nerd numbers on here. So fracture toughness and and then and, and strength values, it's it's about thirty percent stronger than anything that we that we tested for that we've tested out of the aerospace field and it's about double the fracture toughness so it's it's, it's stronger and it's, and it's it's twice as tough which is these are phenomenal numbers and then uh in-house validation this is this is we've we've you know we've got the commercial product back this is this is this is a ceramic armor this is on a body armor package this type of failure in a ceramics difficult to get it's just like the, that's the adhesive is do, is doing its job if if the ceramic has this much damage in it, and then we see where the 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 back plate and the various layers are 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 not debonded. I just I can't emphasize how difficult that is for the for the adhesive to to, to pull that off. So so the the performance that we got from the product has been validated by by ARL. All right, if you're still awake. These these are probably the four most important slides. If I it's like if I had to slide anything about anything about standards on, on translational science, is uh these these plots have have, have been these, these these are called Pasteur plots and they they've been showing up a lot recently. I think the original work for this you know Pasteur plot the concept came out like ten years ago, but these you know anything in academic they're they're trickling out. These these things are in fashion for like the last year or two. Where you're basically plotting a, a fundamental understanding versus versus relevance, and then peer review papers are typically up here in in, in the Bohr sector. Bohr from uh, quantum mechanics back in the 1920s. It's it's just basic research, but little relevance. This is a tinkering box where you have low low fundamental understanding, low relevance. But this box is important. Everything everything is born out of here. And the opposite end, you have you have high relevance but low fundamental understanding. Edison's box, and then I would box traditional performance requirements in here. They're firmly Edison's box. It's like they're very, very applied, and you don't understand anything about the fundamental research on them. So what we did with mill PRF 32662 was we, was put one up here in Pasteur's plot, where it's, it's use inspired basic research. Think about you know our our performance standards is we can trace the entire pedigree of its development is 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 traced to you know there's corresponding peer review papers that were that were coming out at the same time that we were developing the standards so 
this this one this one's vetted out in a, in the literature to try to you know to to raise a level on on a performance standard. All right. Another thought on performance standards, right? Is this is one thing that you know this is this is lost in the performance standard. Like, but we did for mill PR thirty two six sixty two was unintentionally, but now it looked like a genius because it was in the literature. But you know, in hindsight, you know, it was we wrote what's called an anticipatory standard. Uh, you know, standards aren't static. They should they should scale with the with the S curve on you know, your classic S curve of, of performance versus time. And then something like like a like a flight standard that that uh, DoD still uses, like like MMMA, you know, 132. That's got origin dates back to the to the 1950s, and that first qualified product in 1955, and it's still used for by by uh, it's still it's still run by Navair. Um, but the problem with that is it's like it's a huge impediment for getting across the valley of death from Tierra level three to four. It it kills almost everything coming off, off the bench because it's it's so uh, it's so difficult to achieve with experimental product. So uh, you know, thirty two six sixty two is forward looking. It's instead of being a roadblock, it, it was it was written to entice risky solutions, probably because we can because an armored vehicle is not going to follow this guy thirty five thousand feet. So why do I have to take you know uh you know, flight, you know, flight risk, risk mitigation on it. But, uh, you know, it was written at a low standard and eventually your, your standards should, should go through a transition phase where they're enabling and then finally responsive where you're just looking at quality assurance meth, uh, methodologies. So this, so your standards should evolve according to that S curve. And then, uh, who does this really, really well is, is the, uh, is the telecommunications industry has traditionally has traditionally ridden the S curve very very well with uh with with standards, and the classic story uh, for matching the S curve with standards is is if you're old enough, uh, Betamax versus VHS. Everybody thinks like, well, why did Betamax get killed? It was because their their tape was funny. It was bigger. It's just like no VHS tape beat them on on the standards protocol. That's why that's why Betamax lost. So. Uh, yeah, I think it was relevant to the earlier discussion. We were talking about the you know the Chinese coming with the ISO standards really really fast. So you have to look at look at standards as 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 evolving it as as it's going to have a finite lifetime. And, and eventually, I, you know, I hopefully hopefully you know and and you know within you know twenty thirty years somebody somebody knocks my standard out, which which they should. Um, other thing about thirty two six sixty two. I said it was the correlations were were derived because you were taking a lot of data. We we for for the for the correlation statistics, it was all housed in a database is where we got the numbers for the standard where we pulled out our limits. And then uh all that digital infrastructure was embedded in the standard. We carried that with the standard. It's like the standard was written a, a certain way to to enable that, that digital infrastructure that we that we that we built with the standard, and then uh, so what we're working with now, and this this solves the industry problem, you know that to you know is is you know if if I'm if I'm running a standard that's on a digital database, why can't I why why can't I hold my hold my QPL open up up in the up in the public domain and let vendors self qualify to my database? Because it would eliminate a lot of uh, my labor costs, and then what we want to do by, by holding holding the the QPL in the digital domain with with pedigree data, you know, can I all the all the data sets, every everything that would that would get a skeptical engineer to to buy, to, to try your product up up to a complete modeling package in the, in the QPL is, I want to make it easier for my my vendors qualifying to my database to sell to non non DOD non DOD uh applications. So that's why we uh we want to go with a with a digital database for the uh and in, in interface for the standard. And so we're working right now with uh we're working with with ASM International to to develop the digital platform to to house it house it in the open domain. 
you know, and eventually we'd like to, we'd like to transition the, the standard out through ASM and then maybe up to, up to, up to ASTM. All right. So that's, uh, that's about it. So some out of the box concepts for, for 32, 662. And if anybody's got any questions, I'll try to answer them. Again, I'm Rich for Salius Lockheed Martin. I'm interested in uh, the constituent chemicals in an adhesive that would support um, uh, this example of the adhesive in 32662. And again, it's a performance standard. So you may or may not know the specific constituents of the adhesive. Um, how do you go about that in validating it, or do you just kind of trust a PPL, or do you have an NDA in place that you can actually analyze the constituents within the adhesives? Uh, you asked me a, a perfect question because it dovetails like nicely to what you were asking before about about uh, hazards. But that's like that's part of the that's part of the standard standard package that you're going to get anyways on, on an adhesive with the PDF technical data sheet. You're going to get the 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 material safety data sheet or the MDS MSDS safety data sheet they call now. A big thing for going. This was like another big reason that we wanted to go with a, a digital platform on uh, on housing the QPL for the standard. It eliminates. I'm telling like just it'll flat out eliminate the environmental phase out issues we have. In the, in the adhesives industry because when you look on when you get that safety data sheet from the vendor it'll have all those cast numbers the chemical abstract services numbers and you plug that in a database that's stuff like it's just like it's just you know you get the you get the subscription for it for like something so like grand am it tells you it tells you where you know all current and pending future legislations across Europe, Asia, and the global market on, on where that's going to be a phase out risk. So I'm not looking at, you know, half the, half the I'm a nuisance problems we have with, with DOD and adhesives is trying to, trying to find substitutes for something that qualified like in 1965, you know, and it got phased out because the Europeans phased it out because of reach. But uh, if it's if your if your QPL is on a on a digital platform and you're and you're tying in those cast numbers, which is like we could do that 12 years ago on a commercial database platform, it's just like eliminate the problem before it starts. If you see it's pending, don't buy it. You know, it's just it's right there. So the key thing here is you were able to come up with a correlation that, that got you to that point. A correlation that was commercially relevant. Well, no, I, I yeah, yeah. but yeah. you're not looking for it. I mean, it could be right there if you're not looking for it. Right. You, you don't know. But so now the solution, at least uh, I wrote down it was the PR2930 PPG, right? So now the question is, out of the box, did that meet based on the correlation? Or did they have to tweak that even after you got your correlation? No, it, it it met on the box because we we validated against against uh against uh against armor package is it, it shoots very very well, but other thing you'll notice about this is different about a ground vehicle adhesive versus aerospace. Air, like look at look at the box, it's ambiguous, right? There's like look, I'll take anything over over like fifteen hundred psi strength, anything if you get over this over the strength plateau. Aerospace, aerospace, compare and contrast aerospace with ground field. Aerospace is always going to trend better. It's like, well, 5,500 pounds per square inch is better than 5,000, right? It's always going to be a one up, one up, one up, stronger, stronger, stiffer, stiffer, stiffer. Armor is completely different. So, like, I can I can almost qualify an infinite number, infinite number of group one adhesives in that box, depending, like, one that hits that low strength might be better, better for a particular armor package than a, than a, uh, than a high strength adhesive. And that that was a that's how we this is how we conveyed that unique challenge with with armor adhesives and that standards by by kind of leaving the performance domain kind of wide open. Like the key for it was like once we had that mapping on on commercial pro, commercial product performance, we saw where the existing commercial product space was, and then we set the goal just out of reach. That's where group one is. It, it's about 
it's like it's like an arm's length out of, out of reach of what you could get with commercial commercial product, which is which is why I pushed the product to, to get in there. Thank you. Hey, Jim Weixner, I was just going to ask you, you have a QPL, and generally we frown upon single listed QPL. Has anyone else qual become qualified besides PPG? Yeah, we got a, uh, it's, it's PPG. Uh, yeah, we're going to, to going through the call with them right now. They're, they're prototyping the digital database because they, they're believing the idea. And then, uh, we're, Working on a on a congressional project with uh with through uh, aviation and missile command, they actually like the standard so much that they 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 that we leveraged the uh, Huntsman adhesives uh, down in Texas to to qualify to qualify a film adhesive for it. So there though, I'll have at least two for it probably by hopefully within within a year to to meet the to meet the 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 two vendor requirement for the QPL. Um, what exactly do you mean when you say digital platform? If you go into the SIS database right now, and um, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm going to speak freely here. The the QPLs and uh, SIS, I mean, they suck. I mean, they're terrible. It's like, it's like. Well, it's like you QPL. It's just like you got to like, yeah, it'll give me, it'll give me a product name and a vendor. That's it. It's like what? And I'm like, and then the onus is on me to to go through and like to to look through and evaluate all that data. It's like why am I why it's 2022. Why why am I just putting up a product name and a vendor? Why don't I have the complete qualification package that you they use in digital format that they use to qualify that product? It makes the data more trustworthy for somebody else to use it. It's like why it's like that company already is is already going to go through several hundreds of thousands of dollars or maybe a million million dollars to generate that data to to qualify that product put it up in the public domain so the next person doesn't have to spend a million dollars to requalify the data it should just be in there yeah i think uh, we got we got estimate from uh from 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 Pratt and Whitney we were talking about this concept a couple of years ago they estimated that, that implementing a, a, a digital QPL would uh, would uh, would would reduce the cost of, of of qualification on materials by at least two thirds. Another couple questions in the back, uh, Tim. First, and then we'll come back to you, Jim. Yeah, one one question I have is you put the entire qualification package. In the public domain, are you in fact putting data that is specific to that specific vendor that maybe they don't want out there? Yeah, this is a this is what we're working with with PPG on now. Like, you know, where's where's the line between proprietary and in and in uh and you know and open domain? Let me go back to this to this pain point. With with it, the industry has, it's like how difficult it is for them to dislodge an incumbent product. It's extremely extremely difficult for them to get new sales in it where an incumbent's been in for a long time. So the the hypothesis is is like, look, if this data was good enough for the army to qualify for, it, this data should be good enough to go some someplace else to to pitch product for. It. So this is why I want my QPL on the open domain because I want I want my vendors to be successful selling that product to non to non DoD customers. I want that I want that because you got you got to think like a a, a a pessimistic engineer like me. You know, it's like I get like you know, I'm like I don't believe anything on, on a on a PDF data sheet that I've, I pull I pull off the website. That's why I'm, that's why that's why we all retest the data because nobody believes anything. It's like how do you get that data so so trustworthy that I can get my foot in the door on a on a on a non-DOD sales? And then this is actually why 
PPG specifically went after the, after this uh, after this performance spec. I was going on my I was going on my rant about how I you know PPG came into ARL. And I was going on my rant about how much I hate testing our one quart samples and you know what a waste of time it is to to send samples out. And then uh, my corresponding industry team leader at, at PPG, my rant resonated with him, and he went on an equal rant about how they hate sending the things out. So it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a recognized problem on, on both ends. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to, we're, we're, we're trying to get around this problem that's, that's, that's been in the industry for a long time with the, the non-trust over, over, you know, over, you know, just seeing a, a vendor name and, and vendor data points. I may have misunderstood you, which isn't out of the realm of possibility. Uh, I misunderstand I thought, myself all the time. So I thought you had indicated when you were talking about that group one quadrant that not every item that or adhesive that fit into that group one quadrant would be equally applicable for all applications because of the con combination of strength and toughness. What? Right. Yeah. So did I misunderstand you or was that correct? It won't necessarily work. You know, I, I can't I can't predict if it, in group one, like we still have to we had still have to range test the adhesive and it match in our configurations to tell what's gonna fit. That's another reason we want to go to a digital platform. Look, that's gonna be still gonna be vetted data no matter where it qualifies into 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 that group one performance domain. Look, I just applied my my algorithms on Armor and got my correlations. If I've got that same data data set up in the public domain, because it's just universally translated on industry standard, I want other people using their algorithms on other on other applications that aren't anything related to Armor to pull to pull product off of that QPL. Okay, that was the reason why I thought you needed. The, what you're calling the digital, as opposed to just the usually when we have a QPL, it's all items that are considered equally applicable for the applications that it's been qualified for. Yes, and that's that's why it's a unique. It's something that's going to be always going to be unique for armor for armor grant. It's like armor's always going to be like this. Armor's going to be like this today. Armor's going to be like this 100 years 100 years from now. That's that's never going to change for armor. So. I, I need that. It's oh, it's, I need that to be populated with with a lot of adhesives because I don't know how my algorithms are going to change and what my correlation is for the for a particular armor package. So I need incentive for for a lot of vendors to want to to want to hit that qualification. All right, keep us on. Uh schedule. We'll keep moving along. Thank you to each of our, our awardees who presented here today.